the the session is about automated machine learning. And I am very excited to introduce Frank Hutter. Frank is a professor of computer science at the University of Freiburg. And he's also the chief AutoML expert at the Bosch Center for AI. Frank has co-organized the ICML workshop on AutoML for the last eight years. And he's also given a NeurIPS tutorial on AutoML. So as you may have guessed, he has He's done a lot of seminal work on automated machine learning. So Frank, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's exciting to be here. All right. Um, so I was thinking we could start just so everyone's on the same page. Can you give a, a very brief uh, definition of automated machine learning and maybe talk about some of the, the key, uh, the, the main areas of AutoML? Yeah, so AutoML is, Mostly, well, as, as the name says, it's about automating machine learning. Um, back in the day when we started AutoML, people were saying, what, what do you mean with automated machine learning? Machine learning is automated, right? You put in data and that comes out, there's a model. But there's a lot of steps in, in machine learning that we as practitioners and, and researchers know are not automated, such as selecting the neural architecture for your data at hand, um, then yeah, um, wrangling your data, optimizing your hyperparameters, learning across data sets to also do well on small data sets, et cetera, et cetera. You can even learn your optimizer, you can learn your initializers of um, neural architectures. All, all of the steps that are involved in making machine learning more push button, more automated, that, that goes under AutoML. Uh -huh. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and uh, can you, can you talk about hyperparameter optimization, neural architecture search, uh, just uh, the brief descriptions and any other areas you think are worth mentioning? Yeah, so um, well, neural architecture search is the, the study of searching for the right neural architecture for your data at hand. And well, there is, um, of course, a lot of different types of architectures um, using convolutional networks and transformers and so on. And, um, and each of these individual networks, you also need to choose well, how many layers do you have? How many filters do you have in each layer? How do you exactly wire up these convolutions as it's regress three convolutions or five by five convolutions and so on. And well, there's a lot of different approaches for um, neural architecture search. And well, I don't know, maybe let's get into what approaches those are a little bit later. But um, hyperparameter optimization um, is, is in a sense actually the, the, the simpler um, beast. It's, well, not about this graph structure of neural architecture, but about things like just your learning rate and um, yeah, your regularization and so on. So it's, so it's more, more often continuous hyperparameters such as learning rate, et cetera. But there's also categorical choices such as well, which optimizer do you use? Do you use Adam or SGD? And you can also have um, hyperparameter optimization with a very complex notion of what is a hyperparameter, such as, for example, the choice of, well, do you even use deep learning or do you use traditional machine learning um, algorithms? Do you use decision trees or do you use um, gradient boosting or cat boost or whatnot? Um, all of those can be categorical hyperparameters too. And that then opens up these, well, conditional hyperparameters. If you choose gradient boosting, then you need to choose the number of trees and the depth of your trees and so on. If you choose neural networks and you need to um, worry about Adam versus SGD and then learning rates and, and so on. So um, yeah, hyperparameter optimization can also be very complex. And in the end of the day, well, if your hyperparameters are wrong, you're not going to get any performance. You, you might get um, as good as random guessing, basically. So um, hyperparameters are super important. Um, and, but using the right neural architecture is, is something that, that is also um, very important, because often you can also reuse good architectures that you found before on, on previous similar data. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Thank you for that great uh, summary of AutoML and the different types. Uh, we've also noticed at Abacus that, that um, hyperparameter optimization is important and neural architecture search can also really improve performance. Um, and I'm excited uh, for the session because of your, uh, your, your insight, both in academia and in industry. I know you're 
a professor, but you also have a, a joint uh, position at Bosch. So I was wondering if you could uh, just maybe we start with a uh, Bosch, if you could sort of describe the evolution of machine learning technology that you've seen during your time there or, or any other projects you find are very interesting. Yeah, so I, I'd say, well, in, in particular, in terms of AutoML, the um, evolution inside of Bosch, and in particular, the Bosch Center of AI, where, where I am, um, there it has evolved a lot from actually doing um, basic research, because in the beginning, yeah, AutoML wasn't quite that well researched, towards now really bringing it into practice and, and using it left and right in, in all kinds of different applications. Um, as you might imagine, Bosch as a large company has all kinds of problems that, that could be attacked with machine learning. And well, not every um, person working at Bosch, uh, one of these hundreds of thousands of people can afford um, in their free time to become a machine learning expert. So um, we, we need to actually give them better tools to apply machine learning effectively and, and really make that part of the daily routine to, um, well, not daily routine, but um, make them aware of what can, what machine learning can do. And if they have data, then actually allow um, them to use that data effectively. And well, also make the relatively few um, consultants and data scientists um, that actually help sort of everyone inside of Bosch, make them a lot more efficient, right? Because they, they of course can't serve um, yeah, they, they can't build models for everyone if, if they don't have automated tools. And so, so definitely there, there has been a lot of evolution from basic research to then also drive this into practice and, and really get it out there now. Mm -hmm. It's interesting yeah, um, to hear you say uh, that the Bosch's strategy was basic, starting with basic research and then, and then uh, able to, being able to apply it in many use cases. Because we have a similar, uh, it's it's also worked well for us at Abacus. Mm. Um, yeah. um, it's definitely a winning strategy. Yeah. You, you shouldn't mm -hmm. just just only focus on applications because well, you, you'll always be behind the competition. And by the time you've rolled out your first product, um, then other people are working on the next. And if if you don't have the basic research um, at the same time, then mm, you might be in trouble. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm also gonna keep my eye on the chat here and I see there are already a few questions in the, in the Q&A. And so one of, one of the questions says, what would be the limitations of AutoML? For example, and they say, for example, data size, data quality, and so on. I, it depends a lot, right? Data size, it, it depends on what type of machine learning we're, we're talking. If we're talking deep learning, then the more data, the better, really. If, you, if you're talking data science and data science in terms of how small can you go, then yeah, um, with, with tens of data points, you would probably not use deep learning, but, but rather some yeah, ensembles of traditional tree-based methods or something like that. But even for, for tens of um, data points, you, you can meta train um, yeah, machine learning methods that then actually are tuned to work well for small data sets. Um, data quality, yeah, uh, that's a tricky one. Um, so we, we just heard about some efforts at Abacus to actually also work on wrangling data. Um, and well, that is something that, that you really need in AutoML. Colin, do you want to say something about that? Um, yeah, we've... Uh... We've invested a lot of time in, uh, uh, yeah, of course, the, the AutoML algorithms work very well, uh, when, uh, especially on research data sets when the data is a bit cleaner. But there's also, uh, in the real world, sometimes the data is messier. And so we're, we, we started out by doing some of this by hand, wrangling the data, you know, uh, joining different tables if they've come in with different tables. And, uh, and now we're, working on automating all of this as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something I've seen and, and I've heard a lot of people, yeah, um, start work or start being really excited about automated data wrangling. But in the end of the day, I, I haven't seen 
real breakthroughs yet. Um, because sort of in, in every application domain you go into, the data is dirty in different ways. And, and it's kind of hard to really come up with something general that, that cleans data in all kinds of different applications. If you start with one application at a time, then yeah, you can definitely um, come up with, with some learned mechanisms. And then you could um, say you have different operators for cleaning the data, for removing outliers, for imputing um, missing data, and so on. And then just learn in an end-to-end -end fashion which one is the best operator for this data at hand to actually give you the best validation data. That, that's sort of a, a pretty straightforward AutoML way of doing it. Um, but you could also try yeah, sort of all the different combinations of, oh, I could join this table with this, or I could join it with this, or I could, <laughs> but when you don't really know how your um, tables are related to each other when it's dirty in that way. Um, I, I don't know, what, what is uh, more the issue at, at Abacus? Um, can you talk about that? Or <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess what you're, yeah, what, you, what you say is true, the data is often uh, messy in different ways. So. Uh, yeah, to some extent, it's it's all like a, a unique problem for each new customer. However, there are still some like uh, trends and and uh, different different types of techniques that that may work. And so, the I, I can see in the future there there could be some uh, some sort of general AutoML tool that maybe tries a bunch of different things. Uh, of course, joining tables together might be challenging, but perhaps it can like. Uh, find hints in the data for how to join in the correct way. Um, so it'll be interesting to see uh, this progression. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. Um, especially when once we have data from many different customers and we can make this more general, then then it becomes mm -hmm. really exciting. And I mean, here, here in Freiburg, we work with a university hospital and they have a whole different beast of dirty data. Right? <laughs> then they have a, a lot of missing data for, for many patients. They don't have uh, many intermediate records. And, um, and, and even when they have everything, then, well, not every yeah, um, feature was measured, for example, for a patient at every day. Um, so sometimes it's actually really missing at random, but but often then it's also not um, yeah imported to this or, or put into the system. It's just noted down somewhere manually, and and then there's errors in, in data entry, and it's just yeah all, all kinds of things you you kind of don't really want to worry about, but you really have to worry about it because it's it's all in the data. If, if you know you have one one measurement that's uh, I don't know in meters instead of centimeters or in inches or whatever, um, it, it completely throws, throws off your data point and you, you really need to take care of that. Definitely, yeah. So uh, going back to my thread of questions, um, I wanted to ask what it's like having this these joint positions in industry and academia. And do you see differences between the, the the types of AutoML you're using in, in academia versus industry, that this might even go back to our previous discussion about clean versus messy data. Yeah, I, um, like in general, it, it's really great to have these joint um, positions because I, I can wear two hats. I can really just do my blue sky research um, for um, with my university hat on um, where I don't have to justify anything why this might at some point ever uh, be be relevant, but um, I can also remain grounded in what's actually um, yeah, well, what's actually useful in, in practice and what what is needed kind of right now. And, and if we don't tackle what's needed right now in, in AutoML, well, AutoML in particular is one of these these domains that yeah, um, if it's not useful right now, then we're doing something wrong, um, and we always just want to expand on what it's useful for. Um, I also see this really as, as a, a sustainable model of, of working together with, with industry and, and academia. Um, the alternative is sort of that um, yeah, industry just hires all the good people from, from academia. And then at some point, academia doesn't have that many great people anymore who do great teaching in order to have the next, um, yeah, next generation of machine learning researchers. And we have seen some of that in the past. I think slowly we're um, 
we're getting to a point where um, people are having more of these um, joint affiliations and are not not solely in industry but well still um, there, there's a lot of uh, very good people in industry and uh, yeah industry is also really nice to work in um, particularly when when you have the ability in industry to also focus um, pretty much solely on um, research but what I also like in, in um, academia is of course well I can have my own group I have I can basically spill out all the ideas to to my students and um, then I have lots of um, yeah basically I have lots of multipliers for these and um, you're very free to um, collaborate with whoever which sometimes I guess in industry might be harder and um, if we can move towards um, um, industrial labs being able to cooperate with each other more, then I think that would actually be even nicer for, for industrial labs too, and, and a bigger plus. Um, in terms of what it's like to do automel for, for in, in academia and in industry, I, um, as you said, it's um, in industry, something like data wrangling is, is really important. And in research, it's sort of, not directly there's no really easy handle and so there's not a lot of phd students for example who are excited okay well i'm going to do this and i'm going to write a paper and maybe a thesis about this um it, well it would, would really take someone to to say yes i want to do a thesis about this i want to work five years to really get somewhere with a single paper and and that's unfortunately the the way yeah machine learning academia is sort of working these days a, a lot of the research is focused towards, well, can we write a paper about this? And how quickly can we write a paper about this? That's maybe actually um, less useful in, in order to um, to solve some of the um, problems that are, that are pressing in industry. Um, so paper is often, you know, you have a fancy mass and whatnot, but in industry, it's just whatever works. And uh, whatever works, ought to be accepted at conferences, but there it's often, you know, I had some brittle hyperparameters at some point and some brittle neural architecture and I got this great result. And then the paper is published and um, the work is completely non-reproducible. So, so what I'm trying to actually achieve is to make um, the work much more reproducible. Um, our code is just always online. And um, well, we wrote this best practices for neural architecture search. Um, paper where we said, well, the code should be available in order to be reproducible because yeah, in, in your architecture search in particular, it, it used to be not the case, right? It used to be so expensive um, that for example, well, Google would run an experiment of thousands of GPUs or TPUs for weeks in order to do a single run of a neural architecture search method. And then, yeah, of, of course they're not going to try to make this super reproducible and compare against a lot of baselines and run lots of um, random seeds and so on. And so, so yeah, we, we tried to work a lot on um, improving reproducibility with these NAS benchmarks and so on that we might talk about more later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lots of, lots of great insights there. Um, yeah, I've been uh, following your work on reproducibility. I, I really enjoy that work and uh, yeah, Frank, as, as you mentioned, uh, he's, he's written uh, papers on best practices and also helped to make uh, benchmarks for a neural architecture search to improve reprodu reproducibility because, because a few years ago it was common to just uh, write a paper on NAS that, that like solves one specific case but doesn't generalize and isn't reproducible. But I never thought about it in terms of this actually brings the research closer to to industry because in industry, of course, we need reproducible uh, algorithms and we need maintainable algorithms, and and so it's nice that uh, that now academia is uh, can can more easily produce this. Yeah. All right, and, and I think in particular in AutoML, we we really have to try to do that because well, Auto, AutoML, I think out of um, all of machine learning is probably the, the one branch that is most obviously useful for industry, right? If you have some blue sky random um, theory, then it, it's sort of a bit harder for, for industry to capitalize on that. But AutoML, well, we, we all know that there is really a, a dearth of um, data scientists and so on. And it'll take a while until the university system really spits out millions and millions of new data scientists. 
that really know what to do. And um, so we should really amplify the um, productivity of the few we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And uh, cool. So maybe now we can start getting into some uh, some actual techniques. I see uh, that that was one of the questions in the chat. In the chat is uh, how how does AutoML search for the optimal state? So maybe you could talk about some recent projects you're excited about the the types of approaches that that work best. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so there, there is a whole range of different methods um, as, as usual for important problems. But so and the, the simplest way of viewing it is um, not going to be the most efficient way, but it's the simplest way. So let me start there is as a black box optimization problem. So you have a bunch of hyperparameters that you need to instantiate. They can have certain domains such as, for example, your one hyperparameter is a choice of optimizer and the domain is, say, SGD and Adam, and maybe SGD with momentum. And you have many of these hyperparameters and maybe you also have um, different architectural choices, such as which convolutions you use and um, yeah, how, how a network is wired up. And then you can use your favorite black box optimization method, like even just random search or evolutionary algorithms or black box op um, or Bayesian optimization. Bayesian optimization tends to be more sample efficient than other methods. Um, evolutionary methods tend to do um, very well if you have enough budget for a lot of function evaluations. Um, and well, and then there is a whole lot of different work on speeding up these black box optimization methods because black box optimization means, well, in order to, to evaluate how good does my machine learning method work with a certain instantiation of my hyperparameters and neural architecture, then you need to train it on your training data and evaluate it on validation data. And well, training a neural net might take you a day or um, even if it only takes you an hour and you need to search a big space of say, I don't know, well, the, 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 the size of the search space is not that important. It, it can easily be 10 to the 50 different configurations or so, but um, the dimensionality, if you have say a hundred hyperparameters or so, then typically you, you want to have a your number of function evaluations to sort of be at least in the same range as your dimensionality or maybe 10 times that or so. And, um, so if you need a thousand function evaluations um, and each of them takes a day, then that already takes a lot of time. And, and a day is not even really anything for when you're talking about um, training the, the newest transformer models or, or whatever. There you typically would say, well, maybe have a budget of a, a total of five function evaluations or so. And, and then, then you need to actually really bring in additional knowledge. And... And the, the way that can be done, so, so you can speed up the optimization by using um, what is called multi-fidelity optimization. So there you have cheaper proxies of your um, expensive black box function that, um, for which the uh, performance of your different hyperparameter settings is correlated with the performance of the hyperparameter settings for the expensive black box function. So for example, you use fewer epochs of training of SGD, or you use um, less data, or you use um, downsampled images, or um, yeah, anything that makes your, your training cheaper. And then you find good configurations with respect to that proxy, and then you slowly scale up to um, the large data set. So that, that's one speed up technique. Um, another speed up technique is meta learning, where you learn across different data sets, so offline, you can spend a lot of data on many different data sets, and then you get a new data set. And for that data set, you say, aha, I have seen similar data sets before. And on, on those data sets, these techniques here work well. So probably they will also work well here. And you, you kind of warm start your, um, your methods. Um, you can warm start also with sort of a mammal-like meta learning where you have a neural network that has, um, where you learn to initialize the weights and, and so on. And so we have different um, projects, um, open source projects for actually doing AutoML. Um, we have AutoSQLearn, which is um, wrapped around scikit-learn. So it lives fully in the scikit-learn universe and um, directly plugs in there without um, really any additional dependencies. And 
there we basically just have um, yeah a random forest on, on um, that that predicts which um, 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 yeah the, the performance of different um, configurations and of different um, machine learning methods and. Um, then we do Bayesian optimization. We use some um, meta learning. We also use some multi fidelity optimization. And um, with that, given a new data set, you basically just look at a few um, configurations that are picked um, specifically for this data set. You raise those, um, look at which of them is best. Um, the better ones you um, evaluate with more, more um, budget. And then that gives you your initial evaluations for um, of, the, of the black box function. And then you can do more Bayesian optimization afterwards. And um, so we have that for scikit-learn, but we also have it for PyTorch. We have AutoPyTorch that um, searches in the space of um, neural networks um, for tabular data so far, mostly. And, and for tabular data there, we, we don't need convolutions or anything, but we have um, residual nets with different um, types of skip connections, um, with different types of, of shapes and um, also have joined NAS, Neural Architecture Search, and HPO. And yeah, um, they can actually um, really get state-of-the-art performance for, for tabular data sets. And mm -hmm. even, even by now also um, including all kinds of modern regularization methods, we are getting better um, performance with neural networks than the traditional um, machine learning methods for tabular data, such as gradient boosting decision tree. So it's, it's something we've really checked um, over and over and over again with different types of, uh, of, of gradient boosting libraries, cat boost and the, um, and the models in, in scikit-learn and xgboost and different ways of, of optimizing the hyperparameters with different types of, of search spaces. And yeah, or we're just better with um, modern neural networks by all kinds of different regularizations. And, Crossing my fingers, it looks like finally this paper will get um, accepted at a conference or it's under blind review, so I should not talk more about this. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you for that great summary of all these uh, all these latest techniques. You mentioned Bayesian optimization, uh, evolution, multi-fidelity optimization, meta-learning, and uh, and yeah, um, great to hear that deep learning is better than these traditional techniques like that. XGBoost on tabular data, definitely uh, Abacus AI, we also believe this. In fact, um, we, we have a reading group and we recently read your paper on uh, regularization is all you need, which, which says that deep learning is the, the best on tabular data. And then it was sort of a debate style because we also had the, this other recent paper which came out around the same time called deep learning is not all you need, which, which, uh, which um, argued for the opposite, but, but yeah, I think your yeah, paper had, oh, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I fully agree. Um, I, I of course know that paper and that paper basically evaluated all kinds of previous um, claims of deep learning doing better than tabular data. And those papers appear to fall into the category works well for the data sets in that paper with the hyperparameters that they used in that paper. Some of them didn't properly optimize gradient boosting, for example, just optimized two or three hyperparameters or so. Um, and yeah, so there were a couple of papers that, that really claimed this before. And we also evaluate against um, those in our paper and show that they actually do worse than gradient boosting, but ours actually does better. Um, so I'm, yeah, I, I, I definitely buy the story of that paper because well, they've compared to the same stuff we compared to and had the same findings. So. And ours mm -hmm. wasn't available um, when they submitted their paper. We put it on archive, I think, three days after they submitted their paper um, mm -hmm. to the AutoML workshop. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, at, at our reading group, we also noticed that your paper had more, more data sets tested and also had, had a very thorough study of the types of regularization that can be used to really get the top performance out of deep learning. Um, and maybe I should mention, uh, Frank has already mentioned a couple of times, all of this we're talking about is open source. So maybe later we can uh, post some links. I, I guess it's on your t-shirt, automel.org. <laughs> and, uh, <Yeah. laughs> and we've also collaborated. <laughs> yeah. We, and 
Frank and I have also collaborated uh, and, and some of that is on advocacy study slash publications. All right, um, so I, I wanted to have a mix of high level discussion and low level discussion. So maybe now I can jump to, to more of a higher level question. Um, mm -hmm. I, do you think that uh, sometimes uh, this question comes up, do you think AutoML as AutoML evolves, do you think it'll in the future remove the need for data scientists in the future? <laughs> yes, indeed, this comes up, uh, comes up very often. And no, uh, we will uh, not get rid of data scientists. Rather, we will make data scientists a, a lot more efficient, right? Um, so we want to be complementary to, to what data scientists do. Data scientists will always be needed to really sanitize the data, to check that the data wrangling works, to check that, well, all the stuff that's not automated yet, and there will always be stuff that the data scientists know that is not automated yet. And, and sort of our mission as AutoML experts is to, to automate more of what is being done in, in practice. But nowadays, for example, there's lots of work on algorithmic fairness and on um, you know, I, I know hardware constraints and memory and whatnot. So, so lots of multi-objective optimization and um, there is data drift. And, and so all kinds of things that the data scientists um, are just much better posed right now to, to deal with than um, AutoML systems. What, what we need to work more on in AutoML, I think, is to actually come up with better visualizations, better explanations of what it is that um, the AutoML system does in order for the data scientists to accept more um, what it does, but also to, to work more on this multi-objective angle. For example, the data scientists can say, well, we really should be fair and, and here these are the protected attributes and here are the fairness um, measures that, that we really care about. Now go and find me the Pareto front of different, um, yeah, of different instantiations of your machine learning pipeline that I can then pick the right one from for our application at hand so that at least I don't pick something that's Pareto dominated um, where I could do better in terms of all the different um, objectives. And th that is definitely one of the exciting fields of research that, that AutoML can deliver mo much more on in the future and, and still it won't render data scientists um, uh, useless uh, by any means. It, it will make them more efficient though. Um, I, I can't claim that we, that AutoML can't possibly cost any jobs. So if, if, a, if a company previously might have needed to hire um, 20 data scientists in order to do their, um, their work, maybe they could get away now with five or something like that with, if AutoML is really working really well. But likely then they could get through a lot more um, work and then could hire 20 or maybe then actually 50 or 100 data science in order to get more to get through more work and, and really scale up machine learning because right now there's just all this untapped potential where one could use machine learning and doesn't use machine learning right now or uses it really poorly which uh, is also not what we want to do mm -hmm. yeah that's interesting sometimes i think of it as like the data science just have to stay stay one level of meta ahead of the automel algorithms so there will always be uh, more things to do. But, yeah, also, yeah and I, I think another thing that, that like a new type of job that will appear in the future is, is people that they, they don't need to know exactly how gradient boosting works. They don't need to know every trick about gradient descent and whatnot. I don't know how my car works. I'm not a car mechanic, but I can drive the car. And so I think we need sort of driver licenses for AutoML systems. People who really can use this AutoML system properly and, and know, okay, what, what do I need to look into? What, what type of um, data does it work well with? What, what um, might be the failure modes? When might it completely fail? Um, what do I do with the model when it comes out? How do I make sure that this model um, yeah, stays up to date over time. What do I, um, how do I detect model drift? How do, I, how do I check for fairness? How do I really make sure that this is what the customer wants and so on? And this is a different type of skill set than you know, a machine learning PhD. Um, a machine learning PhD should pretty much, well, should at least be able to pick this up super quickly if um, they haven't learned it. 
but um, you don't need a machine learning PhD for this, right? It's a, probably a three month course or something like that could easily deliver on this. And, and I think we will need something like that in the future. Yeah, that's a great analogy. Um, yeah, we need drivers rather than people who build the cars. Uh, I guess occasionally the, the car might break down or we might need to modify the car, but uh, don't- Yeah, well, of course we still need people who build automail systems and we, we don't want to in a hundred years see all the automail system breaks and nobody knows how to repair it. <laughs> but I, I don't really see that issue yet. Of course, yeah. I also think it's interesting, uh, earlier in your answer, you touched on explainability and, and bias uh, and the importance of, the importance of AutoML and uh, the, I guess detecting bias and also ex explaining the AutoML for, for more adoption. Uh, all right, uh, maybe looking at the chat questions again. Um, I think one of them we sort of already answered uh, the questions about adapting industry and academia. I guess we sort of talked about reproducibility and, and other types of and data wrangling. Um, uh, one question says, how many years have you been working on AutoML? Huh. <laughs> um, well, I started my PhD in 2004. Um, and yeah, basically um, I've been working on it ever since. Um, I, well, so I started working on, on combinatorial optimization. Before my PhD, I, I worked on combinatorial optimization and um, SAT solving and um, yeah, the most likely explanation in Bayesian um, networks. And there I, I felt like there, there's all these different choices that you need to make on which um, type of variable selection heuristics and which type of phase heuristics. And, um, sort of dozens of different choices. And I yeah, wrote some scripts in order to optimize that. And, um, and then, yeah, was, was just really un unhappy about um, doing this manually. And then for my PhD, I said, no, this, this is it. Uh, Nobody is working on this actively. I, I will use machine learning in order to optimize uh, parameters. And, and I started working on, on yeah, SAT solving and so on. And then sort of, yeah, 2009, I slowly moved over to machine learning. And 2013, we had the Autoweka system um, um, published for the first time. And then I moved to Germany. Autoweka was in Java, um, well, because Weka is in Java. And in 2000, um, uh, yeah, then 2013, actually, I also moved um, to Germany. And here with my new team, um, of course, everybody wanted to do Python. So we did um, Autoweka Learn, because like, Learn is clearly the, the uh, machine learning tool in Python. And, then of course, everybody wanted to do the neural network. So we did auto PyTorch. And I also became much more of a deep learner and also then intrinsically cared a lot more about what is needed um, for deep learning. And um, yeah, then also looked a lot more into meta learning and well, using Bayesian neural nets and um, other, other types of deep neural networks for um, as, as a, the methods in order to do auto ML, not only um, for the applications. So yeah, maybe 18 years. Got it. Yeah. That's funny. I don't think I don't I don't think that many people can say they got into AutoML through automated algorithm design in a in a time in 2000 before before everybody was talking about machine learning. Uh, yeah, and, and really, I mean AutoML, we 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 have to thank Google for for um really making the term very popular by well, in a blog post about their um, neural architecture search with reinforcement learning, they they said, well, they call this project AutoML. And well, of course, we had already been running AutoML workshops um, at that time. But really, at that time, the AutoML workshops were much more about automated data science and, and so on. We had AutoWeka there. We had some um, tuning um, deep neural networks. We also had optimized a network for Cypher 10 before and got state-of-the-art performance. But it was nowhere near... The, the explosion of interest that um, happened in the community after Google was excited about it. And mm -hmm. it, it was really, yeah, the right time for, for that explosion because well, they used reinforcement learning and reinforcement learning was super hot at the time. And they used this mm -hmm. insane amount of compute. So everybody was um, 
sort of excited and scared and everything about that at the same time, but but it was something that you would repost and that you would talk about. And that's that's when really AutoML um, yeah, hit mainstream and everybody started doing neural architecture search. And we have this plot on neural architecture search papers and yeah, they, they really more than double um, per year um, since then from yeah, a couple back then to basically like 800 a year now. So you can read three new NAS papers every day. <laughs> no. And it's kind of not sustainable anymore. Uh -huh. Yeah, very hot area. Um, and, and then that same question that says, uh, I guess we've possibly touched upon this already. What, it, what are the best applications of AutoML that, that they can be applied to? Um, and anything else to add to that? based on what we've already uh, I mean, think, thinking short term, of course, it's, it's always where your pain points are in your company, um, mm -hmm. where you spend the most time actually manually tinkering about. about. In terms of research, I think, um, well, actually reinforcement learning is super sensitive um, to its hyperparameters. It's super brittle. There, there's um, a lot of papers written about that. And sort of reinforcement learning seems to be at a state where neural architecture search was three years about where there can easily be three papers saying they um, outperform the other papers um, and not feel that about that. And, and there's just no benchmarks there where everything is reproducible. Um, uh, Self-supervised learning. Um, so where does the training data actually come from? Um, nowadays, uh, well, some people at OpenAI and so on say, you know, much of deep learning is solved is, yeah, you can use a better neural architecture and you'll get a little bit better performance, but really it's about the training data and getting labels for your data. And so you can also actually apply AutoML to self-supervised learning and we're looking into that. Um, yeah, in neural architecture search, um, hardware awareness uh, is very important and it's so, sort of something that it's sort of hard for humans to think about, okay, and, and humans also don't want to think about this. There's, there's like 20, 30 different hardware devices and each different hardware device needs a different architecture. Who wants to do that? You, you want to automate that really. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so that's definitely um, one of those pain points that, that needs to be addressed automatically. Um, definitely makes sense. Um, and I, I wanted to ask, uh, I guess, again, we might've partially touched upon this, but are there any recent projects you have or, or uh, projects you're currently working on that you're particularly excited about? Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I am excited still about AutoSkillLearn, AutoPyTorch and so on. Um, and, and of course, also about scaling up um, hyperparameter optimization using robust multi-fidelity optimization on the one hand. I already talked a little bit about that. What I haven't talked about is um, also using priors. Um, so using um, expert knowledge that um, data scientists, for example, might have. Um, it happens quite often that people don't actually use Bayesian optimization because they kind of feel like, oh, I, I, I roughly know what are the, what are the good um, hyperparameter settings, and I only have a function evaluation budget of something like maybe five or so. So, so if you talk um, to people like, um, for example, I talked to the people at DeepMind um, who were involved in AlphaFold, and they don't really run Bayesian optimization, even though they have Bayesian optimization experts at DeepMind, um, because, well, they have domain knowledge and they sort of just do a manual search in one dimension for five evaluations or so, and, and that's sort of good enough for them and, um, or perceived to be good enough for them. Of course, that, that completely ignores any interaction effects between different hyperparameters and um, so what we worked on now in, in um, some recent papers is to actually integrate prior information into Bayesian optimization. So Bayesian optimization, of course, sort of by its very definition, integrates priors, but it integrates sort of the wrong priors. It integrates priors over the function space. So you kind of have to say, for this configuration, I expect to get a performance of 90% accuracy. Um, for this configuration of 95%. And so you have to define a function and actually a space or a probability distribution over functions. It, nobody can do that. What people can do is, well, how do I set my learning rate? Well, probably it's gonna be something like 10 to the minus two, give or take an order of magnitude. 
Um, we, we all know that. And so the probability distribution that domain experts have in mind is over where does the optimum lie? It's not how high does a performance get if I set the value to this, this setting. And so, so we integrated um, these uh, priors over where the optimum might lie with Bayesian optimization in order to, to get really um, very nice and large speedups. Um, we had a paper at ECML about this. Um, it's called BOPRO, Bayesian optimization with a prior over the optimum and also have another um, paper in submission. Um, again, that's double blind, so I shouldn't talk more about that. Um, but yeah, then, then I'm of course also super excited about um, different works on neural architecture search to um, I talked about how big this community is. And um, because the community is so big, I'm, I'm really sort of trying more to direct this community than to have another paper in these 800 papers, but more to really work on NAS benchmarks and make this community work in the right direction. Um, yeah, and then we could talk a bit about our joint NAS benchmark if you want one. Um, so we have the surrogate benchmark, um, NAS Bench 301, that's scaling NAS benchmarks to, um, yeah, from, from this original work that I did with Google, where we had 400,000 architectures evaluated and took, yeah, 4,000 TPUs for several months to get this data, but it's still only 400,000 architectures and typical search spaces in NAS are more like 10 to the 50 or so architectures and that you can't um, evaluate fully. And so there we built surrogate models in order to build better NAS benchmarks. And um, yeah, we're, we're scaling that um, in joint work also with Abacus, um, well actually led by Abacus um, to, yeah, uh, why don't you talk about it to um, <laughs> model the learning curves. <laughs> All right, yeah. Yeah, as Frank said, um, it's, it's very important to have NAS benchmarks for reproducibility and, uh, and uh, so there are different types of benchmarks. You, you, uh, as Frank said, you can evaluate, evaluate all architectures in the search space, or you can have a, a surrogate that predicts the performance of architectures. And, uh, and so there are a couple of very popular benchmarks that people have used in neural architecture search research. However, they cannot be used for multi-fidelity optimization, uh, which Frank also talked about earlier in this call, because um, some of them are only only predict the final accuracy uh, of a neural network, but but these automel algorithms need to uh, need to look at accuracies at, at all parts of the learning curve. And so we have new techniques to uh, to create surrogate benchmarks that predict the entire learning curve of neural networks. And so we're excited to uh, to uh, release this work in collaboration with. Freiburg. Um, all right. So yeah, and another thing that we're doing is um, work a lot on different NAS benchmarks, like a big collection of different NAS benchmarks. There is um, it has focused a lot on computer vision so far, but now there's also automated speech recognition and NLP and so on. And we're trying to really assemble that all into one big library and, and actually also have this library of different NAS methods, um, NAS lib, that we hope to really become the core driver where everybody then actually implements a new NAS method in this library. And then you can really do clean apples to apples comparisons and so on. And that's, I'm, I'm also pretty excited about. Um, yeah, I have more things to be excited about, but I don't know how much time we have. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we should pass it on to the next uh, session. Yeah, I'm also very excited about the, the last project you mentioned. Um, all right, but yeah, I guess we're out of time for today. Thank you so much again for joining us. And I yeah, think- My pleasure. Uh...